Well, good morning. Well, first off, we get to serve as your Youth Alive missionaries, and we are so grateful that you've come with us on this journey. My wife, Katie, and I have been doing this for almost 10 years. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, with Youth Alive, what we get to do is bring the hope of the local church to the schools, helping churches connect to schools across New York State. Katie's going to give us a little greeting here. I just want to say good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Do you know that your church supports missions? That's pretty awesome. We as missionaries, we receive that support from you, your prayers. Thank you so much. You are helping us do this work all over the state of New York. Got our kids here today, so give them a high five when you see them. Thanks, honey. All right. Well, we get to do this because of what you uh, give and what you pray um, in your own communities. And I just wanted on the front end of a message, give an update because I think you need a little bit of an update here just about what we're, we're seeing God do. So 25 years ago, I was at a local high school here as a student teacher. And in that room was a group of kids, teenagers, networking and praying in the public high school classroom. Do you believe that can happen in America? Yeah, and by the way, that was from this church 25 years ago at Baker High School as a student teacher. And now, as I walked into this ministry, I know that right in this community, another Christian club there at Baker High School is coming back. So be praying for that, would you? And by the way, Youth Pastor Annie Bullard is right there along the way with them, and we got a, um, a stakeholder in the ground in the public school who's an excellent uh, advisor, and so be praying for that and for what God does through your students. And uh, well, I get to do this um, because of the vision of our fellowship, the Assemblies of God, that says we want to make sure that we have... Uh, the light of Jesus Christ everywhere in our communities, and how many you know the public schools are part of that? Yeah. So being a teacher, I re recognize that we could really use with, with, um, with this ministry some connection points with the public school teacher. And so recently, I just want to give you a little news here. We got to gather a bunch of public school teachers around the vision of uh, transforming schools with God's love and truth. And we did this two times in two, uh, 2022, last year. And so there's half of the group. We had 42 teachers gathered at Hills at Windsor in, uh, near Binghamton. And what the whole point was, was bring encouragement and equipping so that teachers can live out their God-given calling in the public school. Be praying for that if you're a teacher educator in this room, and I know there's a couple here, and I think one in this room was on that weekend. Please let me know we're doing another one, all right? I had to tell you. Is that all right? And here's a box of resources we kick out to um, teachers and students, and we just want them to be equipped for the mission. And in there is um, a fire Bible and some other pieces that we, we get to bring them as part of the resourcing we provide with Youth Alive. Well... Just great to be here today with you. Thanks for having us and be praying for the public schools wherever you are. Well, we're in this Back to the Book series. And the thing about Back to the Book, it could be one of the most culturally counterculture message today. Back to the Book, to our culture. Uh, Pastor Tom mentioned uh, in the first part of this series two weeks ago that this is not the Bible Belt. How many people know that? Yeah, here in New York, uh, in fact, we uh, can look back at uh, five years ago, there was a study by Barna that talked about the least Bible-minded cities in the country. You probably remember that. And we had about uh, probably, let's see, I got it written down, uh, a number. We had six cities that were in that list of the top 100 cities population-wise in New York or in the, in the country, and a bunch of those, or sorry, yeah, from New York. And then in the bottom was a whole bunch of cities from New York. How many know that's probably true? We're in the least third of Bible-minded regions of the country, and five of those cities were in the bottom 15 of the 100. So we know we're not in the Bible Belt. Uh, and however, though, you might be surprised that when I get to do some traveling, and I, I went into New York City um, a few times ago here, and it was actually a conference that I was there for, and um, as we travel with Youth Alive across the state, uh, there was a survey that Barna actually did in New York City, and they found that 77% of the people have a favorable view of the church in New York City. Can you believe that? 
Doesn't seem like it could be true, but yeah, 46% of unchurched people say the church is making a positive difference. That's good. That's a good thing. Now, we might wonder here how we can stave off the slide of our culture. We may be concerned for that today. And uh, maybe, maybe it's um, more going to be about rejecting the culture when we see it pop up. Or maybe it's going to be about um, reinforcing where we all came from. You know, America was founded with this mindset of Judea Christian would be the argument there. And so let's, let's get back to that. Now, today, we see signs of post-Christianity all over the place. And though we do observe that identity of Christianity waning in America, we got to ask that question. What does it take to bring it back? And can we push off that mindset? We're in the middle of a back to the book, or at the end of a back to the book series. And so as we look into this, we're going to be recognizing, number one, that we're living in a modern day Babylon. The situation even is probably worse than you or I would like to think. And most people here do believe, and probably across the church, believe that we could have a complete renewal and revival in America. You probably still agree that that's possible, right? Um, that we can come back into it. And Pastor Megan mentioned last week, currently uh, talking about that revival that's currently happening in our midst. Is that really going to be a long term? Is this, is this going into revival and renewal right now? Wouldn't that be great? We need it. We should pray for it. We should be part of it. So in this series, Pastor Tom opened it up by describing the Bible's purpose as primarily teaching us why we can love God and how we can love people. The Bible's purpose primarily is why we can love God and how we can love people. And wouldn't it be great if we felt empowered to pray and, and reach out to people because of the Bible? Wouldn't it be great if the Bible did an internal work in our lives that turned us outward? Amen? Recently, I was tasked as your missionary for students in schools to equip teenagers with what's called the Fire Bible. And it's a Bible that's been used uh, years and years internationally, and we in Youth Alive use it here in New York. And uh, it is not a digital Bible, which made me feel like wondering, do we do this? Do we go in with non-digital? And I just want to just say to you, like this book that has study notes and it has uh, Hebrew and Greek uh, word studies, and it has the commitments of a campus missionary, pray, live, tell, serve, give. It, it has all kinds of strategic uh, tools and resources built in the pages uh, for a teenager who's a missionary to their communities. And I thought, wouldn't this be great by digital? But my confession is that um, I think I was wrong about that because kids are excited to have the Word of God in their hands. Yeah. I was going to just pause for effect or something because you were already clapping, you know. But, but listen, it's amazing what God is doing. We had a girl who's, who was asking me when, we, when she was going to get this. I said seven to ten days, and she was wondering where it was in the delivery cycle. So listen, kids were excited to have this Bible in their hands so we can believe for the next generation. Here's what I learned. Number one, paper must have a lot of life in it. Maybe it's going to be around a while. <laughs> So that's good. But number two, um, the Word of God, no matter its form, is empowering, but being equipped with it is where there is power. Being equipped with the Word of God is where the power comes from. And there's still a hunger in today's generation. Amen. Psalm 71, 18. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God. Until I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Amen and amen. So what are we going to do when the next generation doesn't take the word of God seriously? Even better, maybe, uh, what will we do to prevent the next generation from not taking the word of God seriously? Seriously. Uh, your pastor quoted Charles Spurgeon a few weeks ago and, and commented about his uh, British heritage and how that makes him trustworthy. So I'm going to go with that today. Uh, well, the scripture is train up a child in the way they should go. Well, 
Charles Spurgeon said it like this, train up a child in the way he should go, but be sure you go that way yourself. Recently, I was having a, a weekly get-together with a few guys in the community um, in ministry in different churches, and we just get breakfast. And uh, coming into this message, I said, well, what do you want in your, in your kids? They've got teenagers and some in their 20s, and so they gave me a short list. Can I read them for you today? Captive audience, right? Okay. Well, number one was a reverent fear of God. If my kids can have a reverent fear of God. Number two was an individually owned faith. Another one said, when your kid says, hey, we're Christians, we don't do that. (laughs) Maybe recognizing some moral uh, life in them. And then that they sense they can walk with God and the boldness to help others along the way. Well, Well said. Friends, we need kids who love the word of God, but why? Why should our kids love the Bible? Because it's the word of God that draws them to the author because it's a relationship with the word of life, to borrow the church name. But not for the exercise of it, right? Not for the religious activity of it. We don't necessarily want the actions, we want the relationship. So as a parent, I might come up with a list of things I want as a Christian parent in my kids, and some, somebody I know gave me this list and I thought it was pretty great, is a careful student of the scriptures. Wouldn't that be great if our kids were? careful students of the scriptures, if they were zealous and active in their stand for God, if they had an appetite for worship and prayer, is consistent with worship attendance, wouldn't that be nice? We could peel them away from their video games to get here on time. Practices scripture memorization, not afraid of public prayer, active in the affairs of the local church, fasts regularly. We're talking about teenagers? has a desire to stand against blasphemy and ungodliness, grasps essential theological truth. Wouldn't that be great if our kids were all about that? Now, here's the thing. I'm going to break this a little bit because that is the list of what the Pharisees were good at. And the Lord called them hopeless frauds. You're like manicured grave plots. Grave clipped grass clipped and flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. That's the message translation of Matthew. Charles Spurgeon is the most revered preacher probably worldwide from the 19th century. Again, he said this, it's not your instruction that can save the souls of your children. It is the blessing of God, the Holy Spirit, accompanying your labors. He said, may God bless and crown your efforts with abundant success. He will surely do so if you are instant in prayer and constant in supplication. If we're going to pass the word down to the next generation, it's going to have to be something other than compelling them toward behaviors. Am I right today? Is that true? The spirit needs to do a work in their life. But you see that verse, it says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Here's the thing. Some of us know that have had to endure that verse and look at their own parenting, that that verse is not a promise that everything we do on the front end, everything will turn out well on the back end. Is that, is that understood here? Yeah. You could take that dagger out of your back if you're a parent and understand that It's not all about you and what you put in on the front end if your kid will follow Jesus or not. And some of you were celebrating, maybe, that you've had great success in that. That is fantastic. The Lord has had that success, however, right? This is a book of wisdom. The proverb there is a wise saying, and it could be about training up a kid in the way they, they are built and, and they will go on, or it could be according to the way their parents might instruct them. There is even a translation of folks who would say that it's more about a group of folks that say, really, it's if you let the kid go the way they, they came into this world, you can guarantee they're not going to depart from that way, so do something about it. Does that make sense? So really, it's about the bottom line that our actions can't guarantee an outcome in a person's heart, but we need to be ready when they're young to give them something to take with them. But then there's this verse. It's 
So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Isaiah 55.11. We hope that this verse, my word will not return void, covers up us from a lot of our own mistakes, that maybe somehow they caught some of the word and it won't return void. And, and listen, this verse ultimately is about God, isn't it? It says, it says, it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God has given us the word, and we can be faithful and believe that it will accomplish what he has said it will accomplish in this world today. And that's the hope. And here's the Psalm 78 that I want to bring to you today. We will not hide them, that is the laws, from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of our Lord and his strength and the wonderful works that he has done. Here's the thing. We understand if you're a believer today in the church, that what we do as parents doesn't guarantee an outcome. And what we do as disciples doesn't guarantee an outcome. But we must tell of the wonders of what God has done. We must tell because how will they know without a preacher? How will they know without an encounter with somebody who has been impacted from the inside out? So today we're going to the book of Judges with these verses in mind. So let's pray and see how God speaks to us. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your challenge today. God, help us see what you want us to see today that will ultimately make a difference in the lives of the people we have been called to serve. Amen. This book follows when the law was given to Moses, and Moses led the people of God out of Egypt and into the promised land. But then he lost trust and um, faith in God along the way. And so famously, you'll know that even Moses records that he, he did not do what God wanted him to do, so he would not himself enter the promised land. And then in comes Joshua. And Joshua, Moses says in Deuteronomy 3.28, would be the one to go into the promised land. And in those days, the Hebrews were, were um, occupying then the land of the Canaanites. And, and God wanted them to drive out those who are believing in false gods and doing things for false gods. Even the people of God were doing things they shouldn't have been doing in those days to get an outcome. And there was no central government that uh, brought together the Hebrew, Hebrew people, so it was, it was a mess. And in fact, it says that in those days, people did whatever they chose because there was no king. Hey, Joshua was a great book, but when I was going through the Bible from cover to cover years ago, I got to Judges, and I just, the wheels fell off the truck, people. It's a difficult book. My son was asking me literally last week, how many times, Dad, have you read the whole Bible? And guess what I thought about <laughs> when the wheels came off the truck in Judges 17? It is a challenge. Why? Probably because you keep watching the people of God going to their idols after seeing the victory of Joshua, going to their false gods and doing things that it seemed like they had no recollection of what God did for them just a little while ago. Judges is, is about 350 years where there are multiple leaders in those days, and judges are not the judge like we think of them. A judge is a tribal leader, and they had them all dispersed, um, these tribes, and this, this uh, leader was, uh, would rise up, and God would um, call them to lead, and we would find that uh, they'd lead, and then the, the people were doing things they shouldn't have, and then God had to raise up a new leader to get them to go the way that God needed to. And ultimately, here's the way it ended up. It shows you that until repentance occurs, deliverance will not. What I didn't know then, I know now. By the way, Judges 2 really summarizes the next chapters of the Bible. I'm not telling you not to read the rest of Judges. You should. But it, it is very repetitive and sad. And so, we're going to pick it up here and go into uh, chapter 2, verse 10. 
All right. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. And we read some more about this in the next few verses. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served images of the Baal. They abandoned the Lord and the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. Skipping down, then the Lord raised up judges, verse 16, to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. Yet Israel did not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves, worshiping other gods. In 18, whenever the Lord raised up a judge over Israel, he was with that judge and rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime, for the Lord took pity on his people. I want you to see two things. First of all, the whole book of the Bible is needed in our life. This tells us something about who God is. It tells us about his mercy and how when there was no king, he led. He still, through the spirit of God, spoke to the hearts of the, of the leaders. And, and the whole Old Testament focuses on God the Father, and we see Jesus focused in the New Testament and the Holy Spirit, the three-in-one, is all through the whole scriptures. And the book is about God's story. And it also tells me who I am. It also tells me where I fit. The book also tells me what difference I can make. We need the book in our culture. We need the book first in our lives. Without it, we lose our identity. It was a forgetting, wasn't it? It was a a forgetting that this generation did. They didn't acknowledge the Lord. It was like the book was on a shelf. You know the feeling? The book of what happened was on the shelf, and they didn't even know what God did for them. So they looked elsewhere for things that he already does. And when you look elsewhere for something God already does, you can't say God is good because you don't know for, from experience. You don't know why he's good. So again, they didn't acknowledge him, and they didn't know what he did for them. But they knew about God. You see, they knew there was a God. They knew something about how he saved their ancestors, actually just their grandparents. And maybe they even asked, well, what have you done for me lately? It's hard to understand why God asked them to drive out people and cultures out of the land unless you really see what God was trying to do to preserve his people so that he could one day bring a king that would permanently change everything. But he asked them to drive out the people with their gods, but they didn't. They made friends. And they actually participated in their worship. What did they do in today's church age way of thinking? What did they do as if it were happening today? It's essentially like turning from Jesus, the word of God, and choosing your own way over God's. And everything was preserved for them, guys. Everything was written out. Moses had the five books. He even did Deuteronomy, which is a revision of the whole thing. Like, not revision, but revisiting. Another giving. It's another giving of the law. A second giving. It was a little over a month ago, and I was standing in a library in Houston, a theological library. I was with a bunch of people who do what I do, and somehow we went to a library. It was... Interesting that that was part of the agenda, but it was cool because we got to see some pictures. Um, Sorry, I have pictures. We got to see some uh, facsimiles of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I actually saw a real fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So what what is the Dead Sea Scroll? Well, Um, Here's from an author, Tim Challies. While recent scholarship has questioned the preservation of the original manuscripts of the Bible, the truth is that the Bible has more evidence for its integrity than any other ancient book. In 1946, a Bedouin shepherd discovered a handful of ancient scrolls in the caves of Qumran. A deeper search over the next two years led to the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most significant manuscript discovery of the modern era. 
Archaeologists found thousands of biblical fragments dating back to the second century. They were lining up 95% of what had been already in their possession that was written in the ninth century. So something from way back lined up with all the copies, 95%. There were just some little minor errors, scribal type errors. And what's the significance of this? It's just one piece of evidence that over many centuries, God preserved the Hebrew text. Because of the similarities in the manuscript, we can be confident that the Old Testament we have today is highly reliable in a highly reliable copy of the Hebrew Scriptures. When you think about how God preserved every word for us today, far better than any book in history, can you hear the message from God, the God of the universe, folks? who is tremendously interested in people knowing him, how much he wants us to know who he is and what he's done. But here's the thing. You can know all about God, but not have a relationship with Jesus. It's not just about knowledge. Knowledge doesn't give us relationships. I can read all about famous people. I can bump into them in the store, and they will say, you do not know me. And the same goes for God. Some of you may may be in this faith community connection because of the morality that it brings or the goodness that you feel. Some of you may be fitting in because what you enjoy about the people. Some of you are Christians that regularly get away from the word of God and if you're in that camp, you have good company because we're all on that camp. And we have a heart that wants to wander. My question for all of you is, do you love Jesus? If you love Jesus because God forgave your sins and restored you to himself, then it's like, I want to serve him and I want to know him and I want to get back to the book because that's where life is. My experience trumps my knowledge My experience in the word of God with Jesus trumps anything. Jesus went to death on the cross for us. That's what brings you to have firsthand faith. Firsthand faith is what we're looking for. We can't pass on firsthand faith, can we? Do you have a firsthand faith based on the word of God? Here are the realities. Number one, when we live a life of knowing about God rather than knowing God, we are on our way toward God. Bail. When we live a life where we allow God's quiet keeping, as one author says, or God's dramatic rescue to slip into oblivion, we're on our way toward Baal. When we live a life trying to coerce God like pagans rather than just trust God, we're on our way toward Baal. When we let the ones in our care go forward without knowing God or God's works, we're sending them into Baal. Here's the root of the matter. There was a people that didn't acknowledge God, and there was a people, that same people, who didn't remember his good works. The fruit of the matter is that we have a people that were then in disastrous circumstances that only repentance brought them out of and the mercy of our good God. Is not God merciful to us today? Isn't his grace so incredible that he'd rescue us as society goes sideways, as life deteriorates? There's a message of hope for us today. We need to be people going back to the book getting back to what God's all about. And it matters because you're enjoying the blessing of a holy God and it's not a result of anything you've done, but it's a result of the book and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we need to get back and remember that. It matters because your blessings are only known and experienced with a relationship with the, the word of life, Jesus Christ. And we sing it because he never fails. He never fails us. We need the Bible. We need the book We need the book to keep us off going from the rails and going toward what culture is. It will literally keep you. I said that like Pastor Tom, right? 
literally keep you. And I put that in the message for him. But it will keep you. And I say literally in every sense of the word. Literally, the book was kept word by word. It was kept. And we were given it, deposited right in our hands, word by word, every word of God. And God's Spirit is here. And as I come to a close here, God's Spirit is here and His Word will accomplish its purpose. We say it like this. We say the Holy Spirit will help you live for God. I have a slide that shows you what we, what we bring to our teenagers and we train them. And there's three takeaways I want to give you. Number one, we need a firsthand experience with the book. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says this, He, Jesus, died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. We need a firsthand experience with him. Number two, the Holy Spirit will teach us and remind us of the Word. Everything that Jesus has told us, the Spirit will remind us. It says in John, but when the Father sends the Advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, as my representative, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. We, we have an incredible promise and resource in the Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit will give you the power to tell everyone about Jesus everywhere. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We need to get back to the book. Not a, relig not a religious or ritualistic type practice. Some of us need to repent of an empty ritual today. Some of us need to change our tack of trying to get others to be just like us and get back to the book. It's easy to teach people to kind of be moral and be better. But we need to get back to the book. We're not called to make disciples in our own image. And we need to celebrate in the next generation the tiny wins that they make. They might seem tiny, but they're huge. Thanks for pastors and Pastor Annie and the team and the parents in this room that are at the front lines with teenagers. If you're a parent or a disciple maker, we're praying for you. We need to be constant in prayer. If you're thinking about what comes next, you say, well, that was a lot that says that I don't know what to do as a parent and I don't know what to do now. I want you to think about something, that God has given you a testimony of grace. And that when you're talking to your kids and you want to go down the list of behaviors and so on, that fine. Let them see how the Word of God has impacted your heart. Let them see a tear of your great rescue. When you're packing their spiritual backpack, make sure that in that backpack is not a list of do's and don'ts or behaviors, but ultimately, it's a first-hand testimony of the grace of God in your life. Amen? You can pass along a first, you can't pass along a first-hand faith, but you can tell all about it.